Japan's fascination with horror is self-evident. Its contributions to the genre, be they films, video games, or manga, are appreciated the world over. Anime is no exception, with series like Higurashi When They Cry gaining an overseas cult following, and the works of director Satoshi Kon receiving homage as far afield as Hollywood. At the same time, of my anime list's 18,161 listed titles, only 469 carry the horror genre label. 2.58%. Of that number, only a quarter carry a rating of 7 or higher. I think it's fair to say, then, that good horror anime are thin on the ground. We could talk about why this might be all day, but I'm here to talk about why it should change, with the help of a show called Shiki. of animation allows for the impossible to be represented. This is a quote from Caroline Rudell's essay, Cutting Edge, Violence and Body Horror in Anime. As is betrayed by the title, the essay focuses on the ways in which animation can be used specifically in the realm of body horror, citing the simple fact that literally anything can be drawn, as animation is not bound to the limited possibilities of the human as represented in live action. Rudell mentions the argument that 2D animation is simply too far removed from how real life actually looks to evoke fear, then blows it to pieces by, well, talking about anime which blow their characters to pieces. Namely, not only that these anime employ techniques live action never could, but that in doing so, they create an experience that cannot be found anywhere else. One where we made to sit not only with the violence, but also its deeply uncomfortable implications. In Akira, for example, Tetsuo's body swells and bubbles into a mass of matter that is unrecognisable as him, or even as any human body. His identity is thwarted, as both his own personality and body are overtaken by an other, and his human shape is morphed into that which is distinctly not human. No other medium holds quite the power animation does to place us within another person's mind, to overlay the emotional experience with the physical reality, such that they become one and the same, the characters and our own. But while many of my anime list's top-rated horror titles do dabble in these ideas, it's rarely with the primary aim of inciting fear, shock, or disgust. The things most definitions seem to agree define the horror genre. And then there's Shiki. Shiki, originally created by Huyumi Ono, was first published as a duology of novels back in 1998, and was later adapted into an anime series in 2010 by Studio Dawn. The series is set in the summer of 1994, in a small rural village by the name of Sotoba where very little happens. This is why when a European-style mansion is erected on a hill overlooking the village, and its inhabitants move in in the middle of the night, it's the talk of the town. That is, until something even stranger happens. All of a sudden, people presenting only with seemingly mild cases of anemia begin dropping dead at alarming rates. Be assured I am not spoiling you when I say Shiki is a vampire story. It's in the series synopsis. I am, however, going to be going into actual spoilers starting from now, so consider yourself warned. Shiki is the perfect case study for this video because I don't know whether I'd call the original novels horror at all. They put a much heavier focus on crafting an actual mystery, whereas the anime opts to make clear what's actually going on almost immediately and in the process, completely alters the experience the audience have with the story. While in the novels you're wondering and reasoning along with the characters, in the anime you're already in on everything they aren't, in a way that immediately makes the entire thing much scarier. It's exactly the kind of bold decision I wish more people would take in the process of adapting material into a new medium. One that says, we know we have the opportunity to do things that the original could not, 
and we're going to use them to create a fresh take on the same story. Each and every one of Shiki's most frightening scenes could only have been achieved through animation. The Shiki, literally corpse demons, conform to a number of rules plucked from vampiric folklore, one being that they cannot enter a home unless invited. Many of the show's most hair-raising moments come as a result of this simple fact. For example, the instant a Shiki and a human come face to face, with the knowledge that only this incredibly fragile barrier still separates them, one anybody could unwittingly shatter at any moment. Shiki makes it so that the tap, tap, tap of a finger against a window, or a girlish giggle just beyond the shoji screen, is enough to leave you sleeping with the lights on for a week. If we're talking about experiences that can only be created through animation, there's one particular scene that warrants in-depth discussion. In it, our protagonist, Natsuno, is staying over at his best friend Toru's house after having become aware of the Shiki. One of their first victims was a girl named Megumi, another teenager with an obsessive love for Natsuno that leads her to spy on him for hours at a time, day after day. He clocks on when the visits resume shortly after Megumi's funeral. In the scene, upon realising with horror that the new family from the mansion, and by extension all Shiki, have already been invited into the house by Toru himself, we watch him lie literally paralysed with fear as he hears a door slide open on the floor below and stairs begin to creak under the weight of footsteps. The walls, ceiling and floor fizzle out, leaving only the contours of the room and Natsuno suspended in darkness. Sure, he can feel Megumi's eyes on him, even from beyond the closed door. The midsummer night ambience is overpowered by Natsuno's laboured breathing and the sound of his thundering heartbeat. Here, the show makes sure we're not just watching the events play out, but experiencing them alongside our lead, placing us literally within his fear-distorted perception. The music leaps into the fore along with a cacophony of noises as the door begins to slide open. There's a sound like a wind chime has fallen to the floor and broken into pieces, a pitchy alarm bell, and it's Toru's little sister looking for help with her homework. Relief for both Natsuno and the viewer. Immediately, the scene returns to normal. Natsuno is in his best friend's bedroom. The only sound we hear is soft cicada song. It's like how a lead has had some kind of lucid dream, only to awaken and see reality replace the scene his brain had constructed. A moment to breathe. And then... Yuki-kun? <laughs> You hear her bones shift in ways they shouldn't. This body that has defied nature to stand here. Cold flesh and a skeleton that should have stayed in its coffin. The strange pallor is back, the room contorting and filled with static as though Natsuno has forgotten to breathe and his vision is beginning to fade. When Megumi looks at him, her eyes are voids. And then, the only thing that could be more terrifying happens. She looks at Toru. The distorted sound of somebody gasping for breath between sobs, and the string of an instrument breaking. In a lot of ways, Megumi isn't any different from when she was human. She's jealous, and she's angry. As she stands over Toru speaking and he doesn't even stir, everything begins to feel slightly surreal. This can't actually be happening, Natsuno's still dreaming. That's what he wants to believe, because how could this be real? But it is. <laughs> If 
you still don't think anime can be scary, I give up. But that's the thing. To say scenes like this are the sole reason Shiki is scary, or the sole reason it may qualify as a horror series would still be inadequate. Vampires are scary, but not just by virtue of their dietary preferences. In Shiki, vampires are scary because they exist beyond the realm of comprehension. Of the novel's some 2,500 pages, it isn't until the final third that the village as a whole accepts reality. They spare no less effort denying the possibility of a supernatural cause to the string of deaths than you or I would, right here in the real world. Vampires don't exist. It isn't until the village doctor is able to bring a shiki in front of the villagers and have them check whether her heart is beating for themselves that they realise the hundreds of deaths and disappearances, the loss for some of their entire families, weren't the result of some unidentified, untreatable illness sweeping the community. At the cost of almost painfully slow pacing, Shiki gives us a story that plays out exactly as it would in real life, and becomes all the more frightening for it. A story where, as a result of the character's inability to adapt their thinking and their way of life, they lose everything. But let's wind it back for a minute. This village is surrounded by death. This is the first line of the Shiki novels. The village's name, Sotoba, comes from the word stupa the name for a kind of Buddhist burial site. The village is closed in by trees which are used to make grave markers. Its ageing population is one of the last in Japan to still opt for full body burials. For the same reason, when the deaths begin in earnest, understanding of the nature of the quote unquote illness lags due to the family's unwillingness to consent to autopsies. The irony being that if Sotoba had embraced the move to cremation over full body burials that began in the 1930s, and failing that if they had at least allowed the bodies of their deceased to be examined, the supposed epidemic would never have seized the village in the first place, or at least would have been verifiably identified as something else much sooner. It's easy then to ask whether Shiki is trying to make some kind of point about the village's archaic ways and its need to modernise if it wishes to survive. It's a theme so prevalent in post-war Japanese horror media, I've already discussed it at length on my channel in regards to a certain other series. And yet, that's the catch. What Shiki instead opts to tell us is this. The unavoidable began in the summer, on the early dawn of July 24th. Already on that day, it was half set in stone, that the village known as Sotoba would be wrapped in the 1,000 hectares of mountain forest that surrounded it, and annihilated. Shiki is a deeply fatalistic story. The reality is that the Shiki and the humans can at least attempt to coexist, and simply opt not to, with the exception of a handful of characters. The vast majority never even stop to consider this option. Social psychology can go some way to explaining what is happening here. The Shiki and the humans see two different realities, wherein for each, they are the victims of this scenario. In Mercy Noor and colleagues' article, When Suffering Begets Suffering, The Psychology of Competitive Victimhood Between Adversarial Groups in Violent Conflicts, it is explained that, over time, focusing on the in-group's psychological suffering can lead such suffering to become embedded in the group's collective narratives and collective identities. Though you're welcome to have your opinion on it, Shiki isn't really about which group is right, but rather why each group genuinely believes that they are the one that has been wronged. Or, perhaps even more aptly, how certain members of each group convince the rest to think this. As Noah and colleagues put it, during intergroup conflicts, leaders need followers who view themselves as a group that faces a severe injustice. While the humans watch their loved ones die, the Shiki long to return to being human and being accepted, caught within an exploitative hierarchy of their own. See, the Shiki community functions very similarly to an organised crime group. 
Freshly risen corpses are shut up in remote huts on the boundaries of the settlement and put through something of an initiation. Left in a room with only a weakened human and their hunger, they will not be allowed to leave until they have completed their first kill. Anybody who shows reluctance is threatened with torture or worse. While most shiki fall into a sleep too deep to wake from come daybreak, a handful do not possess these weaknesses. These shiki, the jinlo, can thus assert themselves over the less evolved shiki, with the threat that should they disobey orders, they will be carried out into the daylight once they fall asleep and left to burn. The shiki community abide by strict rules laid out by the kudishkis, the family from the mansion, and the jinlo who serve them, with anybody who refuses to follow these rules treated as traitors to a group they never asked to be a part of. The more reluctant are guilt tripped, with the knowledge that the Kadishki family dug them up, provided them with their first meal and a safe haven, and are told that if they leave, they will be punished in accordance with the risk they'd be exposing the entire community to were they to be found. The new Shiki are, quite simply, given no option but to murder or be murdered. Even so, the community offered to the Shiki, however twisted in structure, has an emotional hold on certain members all the same, much in the same way that vulnerable children from abusive or non-existent homes are deliberately drawn into gangs with the promise of a place to belong. In the end, attacking others is the one action which allows them to retain some sense of agency within their oppressive circumstances. While they may not be allowed to leave the village, they can at least choose their prey within it, and in doing so, momentarily become the powerful rather than the powerless. When trying to win over a hesitant new member of their ranks, the Jinlo Tatsumi legitimizes their actions as such. The prey can't resist, it can't do a thing to hurt you. At first, he may look at you with hateful eyes, but once you attack, he'll become calm. When we attack, you see, they end up feeling pretty good. Afterwards, they really do put up no resistance at all. They don't say anything particularly hateful, nor look at you with resentment. Some people even come to be quite happy to be attacked. Sounds a bit familiar? This isn't the only instance wherein we see parallels drawn between the Shiki's attacks and sexual violence. Sunako is the de facto leader of the Shiki, presumably hundreds of years old, yet eternally 13, the age she was when she died. It's worth taking a look at how her assault by the Shiki Utanta is framed. <laughs> If this is all starting to feel awfully cyclical, it's because it is. The humans have every reason to hate the Shiki, but in one brilliant parallel, we see the contradiction. The show opens with the village banding together to search the mountains for Megumi after she first goes missing. In the final episode, they do the same thing, only this time, it's to kill her. No longer is Megumi the vulnerable child, the emblem of innocence. No longer is she even afforded an individual identity. Now, she is simply one of them. Throughout Shiki's final act, we see an abundance of what social psychologists call delegitimization. This in turn springs from the concept of homogeneity, the tendency to perceive a group as a monolith all guilty of and equally able to take responsibility for the same sin. <laughs> the humans ultimately undergo de-individuation. This is the mechanism behind mob violence, the process whereby a person sacrifices their individuality unto a wider group identity and subsequently finds themselves able to engage in acts they previously wouldn't have, as they no longer fear having such actions attributed directly to them. When the humans unite under their shared banner as victims of the Shiki's violence, they become emboldened in their response to it. Shiki ultimately posits this. 
For all of our advances as a species, little of what really needs to has changed, or ever will. Science was never going to solve a problem like this. The idea that humans are fated to suffer isn't a novel one, but most of the art that explores it promises eventual relief in the form of, if nothing else, an absolute death. Shiki does not. The Shiki, whatever the humans may say, are not a monolith, and their feelings about their predicament vary widely. They didn't choose, after all, to rise up. It doesn't happen to every corpse, and while some take this as a sign that there's something special about them, equally as many see it as a curse. They weren't always monsters. One attacks her son and husband, in hopes of rebuilding their home within the Shiki community, only for the both of them to remain dead, leaving her alone and ultimately reinforcing her belief that she never deserved that home or that love in the first place. Clearly, her husband and son weren't carrying whatever defect she had, or else they wouldn't be resting peacefully while she had had to become this. Another tries to return to his family after rising up, hoping to be met with joy and relief, instead finding pure terror and complete rejection. The Shiki have no home to go back to. When Kaori, one of Megumi's friends, becomes aware that she has risen up, she doesn't know how to feel. She wonders if Megumi is scared and suffering. She doesn't herself know how to grieve a death suspended in animation. Regardless of whether we really do ever stop grieving the loss of a loved one, or indeed whether we should, Shiki explores what it's like to not even be given the choice. Following Toru's death, Natsuno speaks with his father at his wake. When Natsuno finds out Toru has risen up, it's somehow more heartbreaking for him. How can he reconcile the person he had known with this monster? And how, then, does the monster who had only ever been taught of life and death as a binary reconcile that with his own existence? And yet, crucially, the Shiki now know what it is to die. Maso nodded. Whether he was breathing or not, that didn't matter to him either way. Either way, he was. As long as he existed, he was aware of himself. That was something he just couldn't bear to lose again. If he could go on like this without having to lose that again, he didn't care if he had to be like this. In his essay, The Last Messiah, Norwegian philosopher Petr Vessel Zapf posits that we imprison people as punishment for their wrongdoings because there is no greater suffering than to leave a human with their own thoughts and no distractions. Surely nothing better describes what it is to be immortal. He further suggests that the depth of human consciousness is something of a defect in nature's design that our inherent need to understand the meaning behind life and death can never be satisfied. The tragedy of a species becoming unfit for life by over-evolving one ability is not confined to humankind. Thus, it is thought, for instance, that certain deer in paleontological times succumbed as they acquired overly heavy horns. The mutations must be considered blind. They work, are thrown forth, without any contact of interest with their environment. In depressive states, the mind may be seen in the image of such an antler, in all its fantastic splendour, pinning its bearer to the ground. And so we repress, in order to overcome our so-called burden of intellect. According to Zapf, we do this using four mechanisms, isolation, anchoring, distraction and sublimation. Isolation can be summed up as simply not thinking, at least isolating distressing thoughts from all others and ignoring them. Anchoring, however, is quite the opposite. It is sense-making, using frameworks such as religion or politics. Distraction is self-explanatory. It's what you're engaging in right now, watching this video. Sublimation, then, is what I'm engaging in. 
the refocusing of energy away from negative outlets toward positive ones. Through stylistic or artistic gifts can the very pain of living at times be converted into valuable experiences. To write a tragedy, one must to some extent free oneself from, betray, the very feeling of tragedy and regard it from an outer, e.g. aesthetic, point of view. The present essay is a typical attempt at sublimation. The author does not suffer, he is filling pages, and is going to be published in a journal. Whether sublimation is what Huyumi Ono was engaging in whilst writing Shiki is a trickier question, but we'll come back to that. We can see Zap's mechanisms of repression all over Shiki, as the villagers resolutely ignore any indication that something might be wrong in Sotoba. Megumi's parents note how people begin to avoid the family following the death of their daughter, as though they can make the wider problem Megumi's untimely demise signals go away if they can simply push it out of their direct line of vision. When you're watching Shiki, you want to jump into the screen and shake the characters, to tell them to pay attention to what's happening, and yet the reality is that most of us would behave in the very same way. If we're seeing this many people denying the reality of a scientifically provable pandemic, it doesn't bode well for convincing people vampires exist, should we ever need to do that too. One passage from the novels puts it better than any other. When faced with an abnormal situation, presented with an answer that defied common sense, it looked like they were now just denying that the situation appeared abnormal at all anymore. But the situation was definitely abnormal. Whether it was Oni or not, there was no mistaking that something abnormal was happening in the village. If everyone in the village is acting like this, Tatsu faintly drew her shoulders inward. She felt like she had caught a fleeting glimpse of something that there was no being saved from. Arguably, Shiki's central relationship comes in the form of the unlikely friendship between Tsunako and Seishin, the monk who oversees the village's temple. It's a relationship that persists beyond the realization on Seishin's part that this girl is the force behind the funerals he has been facilitating all summer, and it ends in his seeming defection to their side. I couldn't help but wonder, reading the Shiki novels, if Seishin is gay. The pressure on all sides for him to marry and ensure he leaves behind a son to take his place at the temple is asserted throughout the story. When Megumi goes missing, a few members of the village gossip about whether he isn't responsible. She's a teenage girl and he's still unmarried after all. And isn't that just strange anyway? Despite the important role he plays in the village and the surface level of respect and niceties that come as a part of it, it's fair to say that Seishin is still somewhat ostracised, largely afforded kindness, but kept at an arm's length. There is a reason for this, the fact that he attempted suicide as a young adult, and that everybody in the village knows it. It's easy then for certain villagers to extrapolate what else might be quote-unquote wrong with him, whether ranging from outright discriminatory to friendly but distant. One thing is clear of Seishin's treatment within Sotoba, it leaves him a deeply lonely character, one who is seemingly rejected by the world, and ultimately rejects it back. While Seishin is put somewhat to one side in favour of following Natsuno during the Shiki anime, he is undoubtedly the novel's central figure, and much of the story follows his journey to understanding himself, from within the eye of the storm that is the tragedy consuming Sotoba while his childhood friend, village doctor Ozaki, ultimately spearheads the rebellion against and eventual massacre of the Shiki. Seishin watches the village die out around him with a kind of detached disinterest. He berates himself for it, hates himself for it, yet cannot bring himself to help his friend in any meaningful way, even before he realises what doing that will ultimately entail. Once Seishin loses, perhaps the only human he had ever managed to build something of a genuine connection with, he is left to wonder where he belongs. 
In their article, No, Everything is Not All Right, Supernatural Horror as Pessimistic Argument, Ethan Stoneman and Joseph Pecker posit that it is through our incessant need to assign meaning to suffering that we end up suffering all the more. For example, when we try to rationalise death as being a part and parcel of the ritualised service of a nation, or else as being in the name of science or freedom, only to realise how many deaths do not conform to such reasoning. When Seishin explains to Sunako that he is upset because young people are dying in the village, she counters it with the following. Whether young, whether old, regardless of their day-to-day -day lifestyle, those things only have meaning while a person is alive. Age or individual personality are too irrelevant. Your time will come, and when that happens, everything that defined that person and all that they stood for becomes meaningless. So any death is terrible. Here, Tsunako is actually talking about the shiki. They too will die, should they not feed, and yet it resonates with Seishin. This is something he says early on in the novels. The three of them died in one fell swoop. Everything, down to footprints of their life, floated away into thin air. Is this what it means to return to nothingness? Seishin thought. Everything a person amasses and erected, all of it was reduced to its meaningless origins. At the centre of it all, we have a shiki and a human who see themselves and their experiences reflected in one another as two people sentenced to a lonely existence on the outskirts of society. More than even that, we see two people who have fruitlessly searched for meaning in an ultimately meaningless existence. For Seishin, if preserving his life and humanity mean what Ozaki has shown him, he doesn't want it. Just as the Shiki often point out to the newly turned that there is no law within their world that will judge them for murder, just as they tell one another nobody will praise them for resisting the urge to feed, Sunako asks Seishin if he too feels abandoned by God. After all, after all their endurance, God refuses to show himself before them. Neither praise nor punishment exists to affirm their morality or absolve their sins. Is there any real reason to do anything good, or to avoid doing bad, then? The point Shiki is making is not that the humans are as evil as the monsters, but that nobody can or will judge them as being such, and so inevitably it will happen again. The horror lies in our continual search for justice and salvation, when they are things that we ourselves have constructed. The antler, in all its fantastic splendour, pinning its bearer to the ground. そして when asked why she thought people liked horror, Huyumi Ono answered with this. Horror feels like treading on the grey zone of life and death, then escaping, and walking in the steps of making an escape. When a cat finds something suspicious, it will slowly approach the thing, meddle with it, and then run away in a flash. It will then repeat that same process. I think humans are doing the same with horror. I think she's right, but I also think it's funny that she was the one to say this, because Shiki stands apart by virtue of it specifically denying the audience this. There is nowhere to run in the wake of a story like Shiki. While Ozaki leads the massacre, Seishin goes to great efforts to save Sunako alone from the carnage ensuring the cycle will continue. There are no winners, no morals to take away with us, and none of the comfort that comes with a definitive resolution, however bleak. 
Zapf suggested that all works of fiction, indeed all works of art, are attempts on the part of the author at sublimation. Yet how can Shiki, which leaves us so painfully aware of the gaping nothingness at its core, be anything but the very opposite? In writing this essay, I've tried to untangle the thing many who've seen this show attest to experiencing beyond its end credits. The horrible sinking feeling. The rock in the pit of your stomach. In his essay, Zapf asks, Why, then, has mankind not long ago gone extinct during great epidemics of madness? Why do only a fairly minor number of individuals perish? Because they fail to endure the strain of living. Because cognition gives them more than they can carry. His answer is simply that we run away. Through art, we expect to be able to run away. To pretend that our suffering doesn't exist or to be given the tools to make sense of it. Through horror, then, we are even able to be conscious of our fear, to indulge it in the way Honor describes, and to ultimately command some power over it. That is only because we rely on the fear leaving when we turn off the TV, to finally again quote Stoneman and Packer. Through the conventional monster, one can acknowledge the pain of the world, while laying the blame on an external actor that humanity can overcome. The act of overcoming the monster gives purpose to life, and the existence of the monster offers a convenient explanation for life's suffering, one that can be partitioned off from life itself. Shiki is brilliant because it uses every tool at its disposal to scare us. Also, that when we come away at the end and return to our utterly mundane lives, we are completely blindsided by the realisation that what we're facing is far scarier than anything we've just left behind.